Before I get into my talk, I just wanted to read something to you uh, so you could put some of this in perspective. Uh, most of you probably know a lot more about the Fleischmann's plant than I do. Uh, but tomorrow, uh, down at the Factoria, Finn and Brew, whatever you want to call it today, uh, Kirk Moldoff is going to talk about the Peekskill connection and the plant. Uh, today, um, I'm going to talk more about some of the mem family members of the Fleischmanns, which is a uh, tremendously wealthy family, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about some of them. Uh, we don't have time to get into all of them, but and also their baseball interests. The reason I bring that up is because I'm a baseball historian, so that makes sense. Um, I just wanted to read this to you, if I can, here. Uh, leaving their home in Austria, Hungary, Charles and Maximilian Fleischmann came to America in search of a better kind of life. The brothers quickly discovered the perfect way to achieve it, creating a better kind of bread. So in 1868, bread in America was made with unreliable home-brewed starters and leaveners, what no match for the light tender breads that Charles and Max had enjoyed back in their homeland of Austria-Hungary. The Fleischmann brothers knew that there was a better way, but first they had to raise some money before they could start making a better rising bread, loaf of bread. So they formed a partnership with a successful American businessman, James Gaff. The Fleischmann brothers built a yeast plant in Cincinnati, Ohio with the financial backing of GAF, and here they produced and patented a compressed yeast cake that revolutionized home and commercial baking in the United States. The new yeast had, I wish I did larger print on this, the new yeast had excellent leavening power, delivered consistent quality, and made a great tasting bread. Fleischmann's had created America's first commercially produced yeast, the very same one that was to become the country's best-selling yeast from that day until today. In 1876, Charles and Max Fleischmann used the occasion of Philadelphia's Centennial Exposition to introduce their new yeast to a much wider audience, the 10 million visitors to the exposition. Few could resist the incomparable aroma of the fresh baked bread wafting from the popular Fleischmann's concession, which was named the Vienna Bakery, and people were drawn to taste fresh Vienna, Viennese bread baked on the premises and served with coffee, ices, and chocolate. By the end of the exposition, America had discovered compressed yeast cake and Fleischmann's yeast had become a household word. Now, uh, first of all, some of you know me and know that um, I am a retired banker for J.P. Morgan and uh, always liked baseball. Uh, started a collection of artifacts uh, many years ago, and when I retired in uh, 2005, I started researching some of the items in my collection. So, today marks the first in a series of events marking the peak skill portion of the Fleischmann's 150th anniversary celebration. As I mentioned, an earlier celebration took place in the Catskills at Fleischmann's New York on June 8th. On Sunday, tomorrow, we're going to have four vintage baseball games being played by the rules of anywhere from 1864 to 1895 down at the Peekskill Stadium on Louisa Street. That's going to run from 10 o'clock to about 4 o'clock. Somewhere in the middle of the day, we're going to have a little introduction of a few people that will be coming down to see this, uh, the captains of the teams. Mayor Rainey is going to come down, Doug Ferroni is going to sing the national anthem. So we have a good day uh, planned. Um, and then afterward, about 4.30, we're heading up to the Factoria Finn and Brew, or whatever the outside 
restaurant's called. Um, and um, Kirk Moldoff is going to talk about the Peekskill plant. And at 5 o'clock, quarter after 5, we're going to go outside and have a, our buffet dinner from 5 to 7. Um, we are actually hit our limit with the restaurant at about the dinner. However, anyone could come down, and if you can't join us for our buffet sandwiches, then you just order whatever you want. You still can hang out with us. <laughs> but I want to thank the museum board members for helping and planning and putting this weekend's events together. Of course, also thanks to Kirk for putting this wonderful exhibit together on the Fleischmann family, uh, getting all these photographs out, putting them in some kind of uh, logical order. Uh, he was assisted by Lori Puffshi and John Curran, and Frank Gadir, who's not here today, and a few others in assembling this collection. And of course, it was the largest employer in Peekskill for many years. I also encourage you, which they probably did outside, to, to get the Fleischmann's book because it tells you a good deal about the history of the family. Okay, let me try this one. Oh. Well, as a kid, I did what most of us did back in the day. I collected baseball cards. Always a big thrill to take my nickel to the corner store about three blocks away and to buy a pack of Topps cards and to see if I got any Yankees. Uh, to add to our collections, we flipped and we traded and we played closest to the wall with the cards. And if we didn't like the players, we put them on the spokes of our bicycles to make, to make a motor-like sound. It was also during those years I started playing a board game called All-Star Baseball. Now, that was produced by Cadeco Company, and which has been continually been issued since the early 1940s. And it was designed by Ethan Allen, who was a major league ball player from 1926 to 1938. The version I had was the 1955 edition, and it helped me learn the names of many of the major league players other than the current Yankees that I knew, and some of the great old timers as well. I really loved math too, so it got to a point where a game would take me about 30 minutes to play nine innings, then to do all the statistics, including averages and slugging percentages and player standings, all pre-calculator days, would take about 90 minutes. In 56, the Gillette Company issued a condensed vest pocket encyclopedia of baseball. It didn't bring it today, but I thought that was the greatest because I learned all about the players and all about the teams, the World Series and the All-Star Games, and best of all, I memorized records that people held. I knew seasons and lifetime averages, who had the most home runs, as my family wasn't particularly religious, this became my personal Bible. And looking back, I'm sure this was the start of my interest in baseball history many, many years ago. And like some viruses, my collecting and historical pursuits lay dormant for many years. But in 1993, I started collecting baseball gloves and bats. And a quick story, I went up to Massachusetts and stopped at an antique shop that I used to go to, and um, he had a baseball bat in an umbrella stand near his, near his desk. So I picked it up, and it said Lou Gehrig model. I said, that's cool. I'd love to have a Lou Gehrig model bat. I said, how much is the bat? He said, 10 bucks. OK, so I bought that bat. About a month or two later, I was back in the same place, and he had a bat in the same umbrella stand. I pick it up. It's Rogers Hornsby. Well, Hornsby is another Hall of Famer, a little earlier uh, than the guys I knew. But I said, how much is the Hornsby bat? He said, $20. I said, wait a minute. The Gary bat I just bought from you was 10 bucks. Why is the Hornsby 20 He said, Hornsby was a great player. Gary, 
Right. Anyway, so I started researching baseball when I retired from J.P. Morgan in 2005. I think I mentioned it. I had been a collector of early baseball artifacts and began investigating items in my collection of 19th century photographs, trophies, and other things, and also early baseball in the Hudson Valley. In 2007, I started looking into the Mountain Athletic Club out of Fleischmann's, sometimes called the Mountain Tourists, as I had been to Fleischmann's with my dad when I was very young and had seen an article that John Thorne wrote in uh, mentioning the team. Now, John Thorne, who's now a good friend of mine, but at the time was uh, just a historian. Now he's the official historian for the Major League Baseball. Unfortunately, a full accounting of the MAC team is not readily available. I've only been able to find partial results from 1897 to 1903, and that just covers 34 games where they won 27. And for example, in 1900, they supposedly played 60 games. I found 38 on a team schedule and only 18 results. So it's really tough. But I'm going to give you an overview of what I did learn and a little bit about Charles Fleischmann's and his son. Notice my high-tech flip chart here because <laughs> uh, my family tree software was not transferable from one computer to another. So the first generation is Charles. He originally came to America with his brother Max, as I said, for their sister Josephine's wedding in New York City in the 1860s. While he was here, he noted that American bread was vastly inferior to what they had in Europe. He also found himself a, ja, a bride, emigrated to America at age 32 in 1867, uh, worked briefly at a New York distillery with his brother Maximilian, but soon moved to Cincinnati, then the third largest manufacturing city in the United States. The brothers met James Gap, as I mentioned, who owned a distillery, and with the Fleischmann's ingenuity, began a new process for developing yeast. Yeast, of course, not only made bread rise, but it produced grain alcohol. So the men then decided to open another distillery in Long Island to be closer and much to the much larger market. And in the 1870s began to produce distilled gin. It was the first distillery for gin in the country. In 1876, as I mentioned, they set up a Vienna-style bakery at the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition. And they were a huge success, and the business finally took off. Soon after Gaff died in 1879, Charles bought the company, and the Fleischmann's company was formed. By now, they had more than 1,800 bakeries as clients. And Charles not only patented dozens of invention, founded several businesses, including the Market National Bank of Cincinnati. He served as fire commissioner there as well, and was a state senator for Ohio. He also had a passion for classical music and horse breeding. He built an industrial empire and passed on immense wealth to his children. In today's dollars, he would have been a substantial multi-billionaire. Charles' son Julius left college to join the family business and became the general manager in 1894 when he was 22. He took over the Fleischmann Company when Charles died in 1897. Two years later, he decided to build a large complex in Peekskill to be closer to the large markets in New York City and New England. This became the largest yeast manufacturing plant in the world and also produced gin and vinegar. Julius became Cincinnati's youngest mayor at age 28 in 1900, and he was re-elected to a second term. In addition to the yeast company, he was president of the Market National Bank, which his father had started, the Security Savings Bank and Safe Deposit Company, Cincinnati Athletic Club, Union Grain and Hay, Riverside Malting and Elevator, and the Illinois Vinegar Manufacturing Company of Chicago. He was a 32nd degree mason and a shriner. 
and in 1902 he purchased a substantial portion of the Cincinnati Reds with his brother Max. He was also president of the Cincinnati College of Music. He was obviously a slouch. <laughs> In addition to a love of baseball, he was an avid yachtsman, owned a stable of racehorses, and was an accomplished pool player, uh, polo player. Now his oldest son, Charles, had been selected by Julius to take over the company as soon as he was ready. Now at age 22, John Charles joined the Air Corps in World War I and was uh, on Long Island learning how to fly airplanes, only they didn't have an airplane to look at, it was just a piece of metal. So he and his friend decided there was a guy on, down on the island that was giving test flights to people. So he, they both went out there to get a ride in the airplane and he won the coin flip to go first and five minutes later he was dead. So this had a devastating effect on Julius who began to drink heavily. And he died at age 53 during a polo match in Miami, 1925. Julius's brother, Max, served in the Spanish-American War and was a passionate yachtsman, big game hunter, fly fisherman, balloon corps instructor, and a great philanthropist. He established the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and the Nevada State Museum. The Max Fleischmann Foundation also left large bequests to many charitable organizations, including hospitals, libraries, research center, and university, etc. He really had little interest in the company, and he was not, but he was made second in charge when his father died, just in name only. His primary interest was adventure. Since Julius was able to run the company on his own, Max was free to travel the world. Beginning in 1905, he went on many expeditions from Africa to the North Pole, many taking several months and often brought back rare animal species for the Cincinnati Zoo. He also wrote and published journals about each of these trips, which, was ex which were extremely useful to our government and to the scientific community. In 1925, when his brother Julius died, Max left his African safari and flew immediately home and was elected president of the company. He really had little interest in running the company and he had little skill in running a company. So he went to speak to J.P. Morgan who helped them put together a merger between the Fleischmann Company, the Royal Baking Powder, Chase and Sanborn, and a couple of smaller companies and that became Standard Brands in 1929. Max's diesel-powered Haida, up in the top right here, was 127 feet and one of 22 yachts that Max owned during his lifetime. Unfortunately, in 1951, Max killed himself after finding out he had cancer. He was 74. Going back a little, 1883, Charles Fleischmann was 50 years old and having some respiratory issues, he was an asthmatic. His physician suggested he spend more time outdoors and leave the summers in Cincinnati. His older sister Josephine knew that the Catskills up in New York had wonderful mountain air and was a very agreeable location for him to locate. She had already built a house near Griffin Corners, which is about an hour and 40 minutes from here. In 1883, he bought 60 acres of land in Griffin Corners, and other members of his family followed suit. They also encouraged other Jewish families, although the Fleischmanns never acknowledged that they were Jewish, um, to spend summers there since they were restricted from other Catsco resorts. The village is actually 45 minutes west of Kingston, if you know that. Within a short period, there were six huge houses on the property belonging to Charles, Louis, Maximilian, Josephine, Carolyn, and eventually their son, Julius. They also built several uh, stables, horse trails, gardens, a deer park, hunting grounds, and an outdoor heated swimming pool. This is, this is like 1895. <laughs> 
probably the first one of the first in the country. Now, if you look at the picture on the right, that's an artist rendition of the family compound. It's not. It never looked like that. It looked more like. Uh, well, I got a picture coming up. <laughs> he was very. Uh, took a little bit of liberty with that. Now they did. They weren't massive, but they were nice. <clears throat> Charles and Henry at his house is on the left, and his brother Louis and Will Mina's house is on the right. It's your summer cabin. So what do you do up in the country? Guesses? Ride horses? Play baseball? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, Julius, Julius and Max, they love to play baseball, and the family created a rather uneven baseball field in Griffith Corners in the early 1890s. They formed a baseball team and began to play other local and college teams in the area to entertain and attract wealthy guests to the area. At first, the club didn't do particularly well, but with active recruiting of college players by some of the better players that were there, uh, particularly a fellow named Art Reynolds, an acquisition of a number of professional players, the team became quite formidable. The Fleischmann brothers also hunted for a new location for a serious baseball field on which to play. And it said that at a game where the MAC team was losing over in, uh, um, well, we'll, we'll say it. Charles took, Father Charles took a bet on the team, although they were behind, and Max Fleischman hit a home run to win the game. So Charles was so happy that he bought a site for a new field right away. They spent thousands leveling, leveling the grounds, putting up fences, building dugouts, and adding several thousand seats for the fans. The Fleischmans also funded the local band and provided uniforms for them so that they would have them meet the baseball teams and other important guests as they arrived in town on the railroad. So luxury in baseball didn't really go hand in hand back at the turn of the century. It was a pretty rowdy game, whether it was the players or the fans. But tucked away here in Griffin Corners sat a grounds unique to professional baseball and for the ball players, they had a patron saint. As a matter of fact, they had several of them. So unlike the rest of the baseball world, the Catskill team, which was called the Mountain Athletic Club, was a mass with no thought to profit or loss. <laughs> that didn't matter to the Fleischmann family. Baseball in the Hills had their benefactors, and Charles Fleischmann and his sons, Julius and Max, wanted to entertain themselves and their vacationing brethren as well. So the team was presented free of charge. So not only did the players play on one of the best kept fields and the most picturesque settings in all of sports, but they had their every whim catered to. There was a stunning clubhouse fully equipped with showers and an attendant. The crowd was without a doubt of a finer breed than a ball player that you could expect. And this naturally extended to their interactions within the village as well their hotel accommodations, which were paid by the Fleischmanns, would have made any league player envious. And travel? Well, there was a special Pullman car for that. Oh, and the pay wasn't bad either. It was at least equivalent to what they would have made in the major leagues at the time. So the Fleischmanns' millions saw to everybody's comfort, especially their own, and it was perhaps the classiest of all baseball experiences anywhere in the country. Now here we see the band leading the baseball team down the street and on the right you can see a good shot of the baseball field that they built. Now the brothers of course spared no expense in getting the best players available including former or future major leaguers. For a few years both Max and Julius played with the team as well. They are pictured in this photo. Uh, hmm. Get my little two hickey here. Well, we have uh, Max and Julia sitting in the center here. And 
and that's probably from around 1896, that photo. The team also had future Hall of Fame players play for them. Miller Huggins, who ultimately went on to manage the Yankees, and possibly, most likely, Honus Wagner played for them in 1896. Now, some articles, like the one here, have Honus playing for the MAC team in 1895, but um, that's highly unlikely since that year he played for five minor league teams, all of them in the Midwest. But I believe it's more likely that Wagner may have played for them in 1896 while he was playing for the Patterson, New Jersey team in the Atlantic League. It wasn't, wasn't, much, of a, wasn't much of a hike, and I, we think this could be Wagner sitting on the right here. Of course, Miller Huggins was from Cincinnati and the Hall of Fame manager who led the Yankees to their first six American League pennants and three World Series titles. He played with Mack in 1900 and then went on to the minors but continued his education getting his law degree in 1902. He played in the major league 13 years before managing the Yanks for Jacob Rupert and Huggins died from illness caused by stress at age 51. I suppose when Babe Ruth held him upside down by his legs off the side of a railroad car, that could have led to some stress. Another one of the men that played for the Fleischmann's Mac team from 1896 to 1900 was Peekskill Pete Cragen. Now, Cragen was originally from Kingston. He had brief stints in the majors with the New York Giants in 1899 and the Cincinnati Reds in 1903 and got his nickname playing for Peekskill's minor league team in the 1903 Hudson River League. He led the team that year with a 396 average. Pete also worked at the Fleischmann's plant for 34 years, retiring in 1929. A couple more team photos, uh, the one on the left, which I have the original of over here, uh, is probably from 1895 with Max, who was 18, and Julius, 23, the center row, fourth and fifth from the left, or second and third from the right. <laughs> In the back row, second from the left, is Harry Stevens of future hot dog fame. Now, the one on the right is the 1900 team, and Huggins is sitting center row left. Julius Fleischmann, of course, is in white, and Max is in the front row, second from the left. In 1900, with Mick Huggins on the squad, the Mac team won 56 of 60 games that they played. Many teams traveled to Griffin Corners to play the team, and they played amateur college and minor league teams from Albany to New York City and New Jersey as well. They even went to Cincinnati to play the Cincinnati Reds. And they beat them, too. One particularly notable game took place August 10, 1903, as the MAC team took on the black professional Cuban Giants and defeated them 3-1. to one. They got with some sweet revenge for two losses they had back in 1897. Now the Cuban Giants were the first black professional team, which was formed in 1885 on Long Island. And until 1891, they were the most dominant black barnstorming team in the country and played in the white minor leagues, representing Trenton, New Jersey, York, Pennsylvania, and Ansonia, Connecticut in different leagues until the color line was drawn in the 1890s. The photo of the field on the top is an eight from 1899, and a scorecard on the right is from the game with the Cuban Giants, along with a 1903 photo of the Cuban Giants down below. On the team that day was a gentleman named Bill Galloway. Most of us don't know much about him, but he was the last African American to play in an integrated professional league until Jackie Robinson in 1946. Uh, that was 1903. 
Uh, well, yeah, he was playing with the Cuban Giants that year. He wasn't in professional ball anymore. So in addition to Honus Wagner and Miller Huggins, there were quite a few other players who ended up playing professionally. At least nine of them played in the major leagues. Uh, one, Nick Altrock, was considered the best left-hand pitcher in the game as he won 62 games for the White Sox between 1904 and 1906. However, baseball was ultimately overshadowed by his second career, one of the most popular and longest working baseball clowns. He partnered with Al Schacht, who we, most of us have heard of, in 1919 and went out on his own after 1934, but he continued doing this until 1957 when he was 81 years old. Of course, at his peak, he had a salary that rivaled Babe Ruth's. In 1902, Max and Julius and two Ohio political bosses bought the Cincinnati Reds from John Brush. Max had already been a vice president of the team since 1900. And the story is that Brush didn't want to sell the team, but one of the politicians, George Boss Cox, threatened to build a road through the middle of the ballpark if he didn't sell. <laughs> they could do those things in those days. Same thing happened in New York when the New York Highlanders started to play. But in reality, Brush was also a stockholder in the New York Giants and was willing to sell the Reds when he became the Giants' major owner in 1902 and moved to the New York market. So the Fleischmanns became the largest stockholders in the Reds. In 1914, Harry Stevens was working for the Fleischmanns and he was the Reds team's emissary to select two players from the Baltimore team based on a working agreement that the Reds had with them. He definitely impacted baseball history by selecting men who both failed miserably. But the player he overlooked and the Red Sox finally ended up selecting through their own agreement with Baltimore did fairly well. His name was Babe Ruth. So the Fleischmanns dropped out of Cincinnati team management in 1915 and appointed Stevens to represent their shares with the board until they ultimately sold them to the other owners in August of 1922. Now, one of Charles' brothers, Gustav, and his wife, Emily, had five children. Uh, Gustav actually made millions in, with distilleries as well when he uh, did this uh, open distilleries up in uh, uh, Buffalo. One of his sons, Gustav II, married Marion Timmons of Peekskill, New York, and ran the Peekskill plant from 1920 to 1953. He also founded St. Peter's School here. And shortly after the merger in 1929, they built a royal gelatin dessert plant here as well. The location ultimately closed in 1977. As a major employer in Peekskill, Fleischmann sponsored teams locally, which competed against other business teams in the local Twilight Baseball League. And when local hardball started to die out after World War II, they supported softball teams as well. And here we have two Peekskill photos from the 1920s. On the top is the Peekskill uh, team uh, in the Twilight League, and below is an all-star team from the Twilight League um, with a few of the Fleischmann's players in there also. Now the uh, uniform uh, they also sponsored teams in Cincinnati, and that's, that's a jersey uh, that I got from there on eBay in 2011. Now, Peekskill Pete Cragen was the organizer and the player manager for the Fleischmann team when the Twilight League started in 1917. A couple of my little treasures from the Mountain Athletic Club. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, it's a spoon advertising Fleischmann and the Catskills 
with an image of the baseball field at the Mac grounds. Uh, sitting up here if any of you want to look at it, but on the top of the handle are two cats with the word kill underneath it. Catskill. And toward the bottom of the handle it reads mountains, and in the middle of the handle is an image of a bearded man walking with a rifle above a, water fill, a waterfall, and it reads Rip Van Winkle. That's kind of an interesting item. One more Fleischmann's baseball legacy. There are, these are copies of some baseball cards that were issued by the Fleischmann's Bakery in 1916. The originals are very rare and quite valuable, especially those that still have a mail-in offer tab attached to the bottom. Some of the players in the set were Stan Casey Stengel, Christy Matheson, Honus Wagner, and Grover Cleveland Alexanders. By 1910, the family had lost their interest in the Catskills and began a family migration to New London, Connecticut and Sands Point, Long Island, where they could more easily play polo and enjoy their yachts. See, up in Fleischmann's, they would have had to take their yacht all the way up to Kingston around the Roundout area and then get on a train to get out to Fleischmann's. This way, they were right there. Um, in 1913, the village of Griffin Corners incorporated. The next year, the Fleischmann family donated the Mac Ball Field to the village, stipulating that the field always be maintained, never sold, and events there would never have a charge. Well, that last thing was modified in 1934 with the family's position, uh, permission, so they, they can charge for some events there. On the right is a copy of Raoul Fleischmann's letter in May 1914. Now, Raoul was the son of uh, Louis Fleischmann and also the uh, publisher of New Yorker magazine for many, many years. And his son took over when he died, and when they sold out in 1980, uh, Peter Fleischmann got $40 million for his shares. Um, so this letter is inquiring if the village is able to accept the gift of the field. And so they said yes, and in honor of the family, Griffin Corners was, form was uh, renamed formally Fleischmann's. Well, not quite as elegant as it once was, the ball field is still there today. You can see it there on the left. And it played host to a Fleischmann's vintage baseball team that they formed in 2007. And that team, which was dormant for several years after damage from the hurricane, I can't remember the name of it, it could wiped out a lot of stuff upstate. I yeah, thank you. Uh, the team is now reformed and is playing here in Peekskill tomorrow. Now, if you do get a chance to travel up to Fleischmann's, you'll see quite a change from the past glory days as a vacation destination. In the 1940s, the permanent population was about 500, but it would swell to more than 10,000 during the summer months. And if my numbers are correct, I think they had about 62 hotels in the area at that time. Now all the hotels have closed or burned down, and the town looks a little run down, although a few of the nice homes across from the old ball field and up in the hills are still there. One wonderful remnant from the past, though, featured on the left, is a restored mansion which once belonged to Maximilian Fleischmann. It's now called Spillian and is a well-run retreat, a place to revel, host to weddings, getaways, and corporate events. Each room is beautifully furnished in period decor, and you can actually view all that on, uh, online. Other than some relics that exist in the Fleischmann's Museum of Memories, this is the only vestige from the Fleischmann family homes in the Catskills, the only one left. And this past June, during Founders Day in Fleischmann's, that was sponsored by A.B. Moorey Company, who owns the Fleischmann's yeast and bakery products. Uh, 
Sazerac company owns their liquor products, and I think ConAgra owns the Fleshman's margarine. So this June, this fantastic scorecard uh, was completed and erected at the refurbished ball field. The photos around the scorecard represent all the players who moved on to the major leagues and of course Harry Stevens. Now on a personal note, I grew up in Mount Vernon and have very many fond memories of my formative years there. I was introduced to alcohol at an early age since my father was a martini drinker. And he taught me how to mix his drinks when I was about 11. He generally had a couple of them every day, but could hold his liquor very well. In the late 50s, he held a record at the former High Ridge Country Club on the Stanford Pound Ridge border. On one particular afternoon, the club's loudmouth came over to my dad, who had finished his golf game and was enjoying his second scotch and, so, and water, and said, Hey, Mayor, I hear that you once downed 14 martinis here. I'll pay you 50 bucks plus the cost of the drinks if you can do it again. Well, my dad drove the 35 miles home on the Meriton Hutchinson River Parkway safely that evening with an extra $50 in his pocket. <laughs> now, how does that relate to tonight's topic? Well, my father was particular about which brand of gin was in his martinis, and of course, he preferred Fleischmann. Thank you. <laughs> Was it here? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's open and there's some food. There's any, anyone have any other questions? Fine. Well, thank you again for coming. I hope we see some of you tomorrow. You might be and enjoy some of the baseball games and, you know, the guys in their old-time uniforms. Uh, first couple of games, they actually pitch underhand in the 1860s. Uh, foul ball uh, caught on a bounces and out. There's a, a lot more than four balls to take a walk. So uh, we have a professional umpire coming up uh, from Long Island that umpires all the Brooklyn athletics games. And so should be interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, you brought something I was going to ask you about because I knew in the old days they pitched underhand. Yeah. But yeah. did they do like they do now with the fast pitch softball? Did they do it this way? No. Well, they're they, not allowed to do They can do this. For a long time, they weren't allowed to even break their wrist when they threw it. They had to, you know, if you were a batter back in that day, the 1850s, 1860s, and you could say, I want a high ball, I want a low ball. And you could sit there and wait for your pitch as long as you wanted. <laughs> Um, at some point, and I don't know the exact year, the umpire was able to say, I'm going to start calling strikes on you because uh, you're delaying the game, you know, because they could go, you know, four hours. If you thought today's games are long, you know, if you're waiting for your pitch. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly when, I think they, well, I know they moved the um, pitcher's mound back in 1883, from 45 feet to 60, six, 60 feet, 6 inches. Uh, I'm not sure of the actual uh, date when they started throwing overhand, but it was probably in the late 60s, I guess. Um, yeah, uh, Jim Kelly was in the Jim Creighton pitched for a couple of teams in New York and started winging the ball a little bit, breaking his wrist, and so uh, he became the best pitcher out there, and I guess they, they relaxed the rule a little bit for him. Uh, unfortunately, he ruptured something after hitting a home run, and he died when he was 21. But he was probably the first professional baseball player, because they were moving, he was moving from team to team, and you know they were paying him. So he's buried in uh, Greenwood Cemetery. They have a huge uh, monument to him in Greenwood.
Yeah, a lot of the old time ball players are, are buried out there in Brooklyn. <laughs> so, worth, they do bus tours through Tez too. Well, thanks again. Um, yeah. Mm, okay. Okay, just a couple of tidbits. Very good, Bob. Interesting as usual. And uh, what a lucky audience we have here today because we have two specialty items. Uh, one that relates directly to this topic. And this is the Arcadia Images of America series, the Fleischmann Yeast family. And it's really much more extensive even than Bob uh, showed you here today, you know, with the ball field and all the big players and, the, and that whole deal and how it transformed the entire community. Similar to what happened here in Peekskill, by the way, you know, driving uh, economic engine for employment and cultural things as well. Uh, this is available outside and it's really interesting that the branches of the family had so many uh, philanthropic and uh, entertainment connections and things like that, including even something to do with Gilligan's Island. I was looking for it here somewhere, I couldn't find it. Yeah, yeah no, I, I had actually shortened my talk today, because, uh, uh, yeah, one of the families, uh, uh, Christian Home, uh, uh, the third, I think it was, that actually uh, bought a house in uh, Hawaii and also uh, an island off the coast. Um, and he built this fantastic uh, property, landscaped, etc. But he, he was host to a lot of the Hollywood set. Uh, John Wayne, Shirley Temple, uh, even President Roosevelt and uh, the Duke of Windsor came out and hung out there. And Amelia Earhart was a big uh, visitor there quite often. So uh, yeah, that's one. And then that junkie, uh, junkie Fleischman. Uh, with the uh, New Yorker, is that the one? He was the one, no, that was Raul. Raul, okay. Yeah, Junkie, uh, oh, they filmed the first episode of Gilligan's Island on, on uh, Yeah, one of the Fleischmann-owned islands. Uh, the New Yorker was basically established by Raul Fleischmann, and uh, he stayed with that uh, business there for quite a while. And the other one is uh, Lewis, I believe, in the Manhattan. Uh, the bakeries. The bakeries. Yeah. Uh, because he had access to the yeast and the bread, began the first bread line in New York City. Is it so, still in, in existence now? Oh, no, I don't think so. This is, you know, a Depression era type of thing. It was a beautiful write up in an old newspaper. You know, that there were, um, well, probably earlier, but probably also overlapped a little bit, I think. And um, not to bore you too much, but. Uh, in collaboration with the museum and the First Hebrew Congregation, we produced this book, uh, recently book booklet, called uh, Pig Skills Jewish Community in the 1900s. And this was a, a very distinct, and distinct, excuse my language, and uh, otherwise known as the golden era of the downtown retail business. This is when all those shops are open, and on uh, Friday and Saturday nights, they're open later, at 8, 9 o'clock, and the Fleischmann, Payday, I believe, was on Friday, so whole families would be downtown at that time. They had money in their pockets, and I'm old enough to remember the sort of the tail end of that. And I distinctly remember because, uh, you know, if you wanted to, just a little snack or something, all the lunch counters were filled, every one, all over the place, in the, in the pharmacy. Yeah, and uh, you know, you had to bunk around like that with people moving. And I always, my only anecdote is this one, that you couldn't go one block without in meet, meeting three other families or people that you knew. To me, your, your full name, please. Gilbert Fredrickson. And Gilbert, my understanding is um, you worked um, at Fleischmann's, is that correct? Yes, my first job was in the barrel room. And what was the barrel room? It was the first building as you came in across the bridge. Okay. And um, did you fight in World War II? Were you in World War II? No. Oh. You, were, you were not in the war? No. So um, what drew you to Fleischmann's? What, what was it about Fleischmann's that... Um, it was close to Verplank. Okay. And uh, did the family, was, was the family good in taking care of um, their employees? Yeah, they took good care of us. What are you, what, what are um, some of the, you, if you started, like you said, we're, you know, in your first job, um, 
tell me how you progressed in the, you were the you were in the company for how many years? 27. So those were, and those were mostly, uh, so you were there for 1950, is that correct, till the closing of the plant? Yes. Just give me some of your memories about working there and, um, and how it made you feel as, as, you know, uh, uh, you know, as a man in terms of knowing that this was a very important factory that you were working in. He, uh, then I went to work in the yard, which they called the Bull Gang. And what was that? Unloading trucks and freight cars, and it was a lot of hard work. I was a ice to driver, and I was a first man for a while too. Tell me, are, are any of these are any of these photographs to you? Did you did, does this stir any memories for you? This the presses. Okay, and what were and what were they, how were they used? You pull them apart and scrape the yeast off. Okay. Um, and this was the whole plant itself, is that correct? Yeah. And I never seen that corn oh. cooker. The corn cooker? No. Yeah, no, no. And how did they trans how did they transport the the yeast, the distillery, you know, the the, the, the finished products? After it came it was put into the refrigerators to the ice box. Okay. Terrific. Thank you for your time again. Gilbert. You're welcome. Bill Baldwin. Uh, Bill Joe, Baldwin. The, the fellow up there with the hat. That's Bill Baldwin. Bill Baldwin. And the fellow with the glasses is Jimmy Curry. Okay. And the fellow just above him is Joe Do No, 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 the one over to the uh, left, gentleman. Joe Doslop. Okay. Okay. And um, uh, my Aunt Helen, uh, the one with the dark lipstick on the one over. Right here? No, right there. Helen Zaleski, her... Um, husband, Jimmy Zaleski. My uncle Jimmy was my mother's brother. And my father, when he moved in, in Peekskill in 1940, when Peekskill became a city, he um, said the job here is wonderful. And then they moved here. Him and his wife moved here too. Let's talk about that now. I, I, now, was your, was, your, your, was your dad from, from Peekskill? No, he was from um, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. He lived in uh, Brooklyn. My mother lived in Queens in 1940 when Pe they moved to Peekskill. Okay. Yeah. Ah, they moved to Peekskill then. Yes, they and moved. Were you, were you born in Peekskill? Yes. So talk about Peekskill back then as, as you know as a young girl and the importance of the Fleischmann plant to oh, Peekskill. It was the heart of Peekskill. My father said it was such an ideal spot to build a factory. You had the trains, you had the, uh, the Hudson River for the boats, uh, you had the trucks coming in. He couldn't imagine a more ideal spot than that. He used to walk to Peekskill and I mean to Fleischmann's until I was in fourth grade and then we got our first car, and then he would drive. He also, I was a teacher at Drumhill Junior High School, and, and, and he used to drive me there in, from 1966 to 69, because I couldn't drive then, and he used to let me off and then go to Fleischmann's and work. So, so, yeah, so, what you, so, what you, so what it's, talk to me a little bit about, you know, the, you know, Fleischmann's, the plant itself, and again, and, and also, like I said, the meaning of Fleischmann's, the importance. I understand that uh, there were more than 1,100 people that were employed yes. at the plant, yes. and it was the largest employer in Peekskill. Yes. How did, so, so how important was it in the community again? It was the heart of the community. I mean, it was the heart. It, I can't explain it any more than that. It was, um, I mean, my dad worked there 33 years, and my mom, when I was in seventh grade, worked there part-time so she could save to put me through college. So, and that was part-time. And uh, so it really has fond memories for me. And I remember going to the city on the train, and my dad, who worked for the Royal Gelatin Department, he was first man there. And he 
he would wave to us on the train as we went to New York City. I used to have that with my father. I would, do, I would go with my mother to take my father to the train in the morning, and, and when he would return in the evening, yeah. this was in the early 1950s, okay. he would come back, because you know, there used to be a, you know, at that time it was the World Telegram and Sun, and the, and the Yankees would play in the afternoon. Uh -huh. There was no real, there was very little limited night baseball. Uh -huh. And I remember my father would come off the train, occasionally have a pack of baseball cards for me, oh, and or there would also be the box score from the from the from the from the afternoon game when I was in you know in elementary school, and I yeah. would see, I'd always look to see what Mickey Mantle Were did. Were I was born in New Rochelle. Oh, New Rochelle. Oh, actually. okay, okay. Do you remember anything about? Um, I understand there was a ball field. Um, um, you know, in the facility. Do you remember anything about sports or baseball a little, a little bit being bit. played? My father, for a few years, I remember, was on a softball team. I didn't see his picture here, though, or anything, um, for Peekskill. And I remember he played, but uh, I don't remember too much. And how close was, how, how close, in the, how, how, you, you started to allude to before yeah. when you were pointing out some of the yeah. gentlemen you said who played cards, would come over to the house and play cards with your father and whatnot. Yes. Talk about how close-knit the community was through Fleischmann's and how it brought the community together. Oh, very much so. I mean, uh, like you were saying, when you go downtown Peekskill, you would meet half of the people down there were from Standard Brands. You would know the families, you know? So, uh, very close. It, it, couple, th this Jimmy Curry lived in the city and would take a train to actually to Standard Brands. Jimmy Curry uh, The one with the, the, the glasses. Okay. My father raised canaries and he used to give him canaries for his daughter and stuff like that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's unbelievable. Um, and, and, and what are your memories of being in the physical plant itself yourself? Do you remember, I mean, I mean for, as a little girl seeing, seeing something as large as this I must was, have been somewhat overwhelming. I never saw the plant inside. Okay. I was on the outside. Okay. But it was enormous. <laughs> Do you remember anything that you, you know, you know, because there were a number of women that were employed that worked at the plant also um, during the war, yes. after the war. Yes. Um, what are some of the memories you might have of your mother um, when she, you said she would work part time because yes. she would go, she would help, yes. you know, to help, to help, to help save money to put you through college. Yes. Yes. Talk she about did. your mother a little bit. Oh, there. okay. Um, my mother uh, was uh, a homemaker, and I went to Franklin Street School. And when she, um, when I got to seventh grade, that's when she got a part-time job to put me through. And some of the ladies in the bottom picture, I remember her mentioning, they used to have little social events, uh, luncheons, or you know things like that. Uh -huh. um, I'm trying to think the names down there. Uh, I remember the names. Uh, oh my, Jane Gardner was the first girl. I remember her mentioning her. Okay. And, um, and what does that mean by first girl? Uh, she was like ahead of the ladies, like the leader, oh, okay. you know, there. And she was full time versus, you know, some people who were just part time, okay. you know. And um, let me see who else down there. Uh, the lady with the glass, oh, let me see. Uh, Anna Gleba, I remember that name. Okay. And uh, was, there was Mary uh, Gleba and Anna Gleba. Anna, must be I remember Anna Gleba. I think so. I okay. think so. Okay. And uh, let's see. Now, did the women work separate yeah. from the men? By the way, just to ask the question. Yeah. As far as I, yeah. My mom said she didn't work with the men. She uh, was very hard labor. You know, she'd come home tired. I remember that. And my sister. So, what were her some of her responsibilities that your mother did in you know the gelatin plant? You said right. My father worked for the okay. Royal Gelatin. Okay. And your mother worked. Well, when it, since they called her, they would call her and say, "Can you come in?" It was part time. The gin department. Uh, I remember the gin and uh, whiskey. You know, to conveyor belts and things okay. like that. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel, do, 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 do you have any memories of how, I mean, we've got all this women rights and we talk about, uh, you know, the women for equal pay today. How, how for example, were, you know, do you remember it a little bit? How, what, 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 what was your mother or your father, what, you know, do you remember what they, what they got paid for their, for their labor? Do you remember that a little bit? Mm, no, but my mother used to, <laughs> everything was paid cash. So she would keep envelopes. This was for the rent. This was, was, we had an apartment across from Larry's Bakery on Washington Street. We lived there. And uh, she would say, this was for the rent, and this was for you know the food, and this was for the clothes. And my girlfriends who have come back to me that I gr grew up with said, you know, by 
I do this today because your mom used to do this and she, she made our childhood. I was just so happy I had my mom full time with me to, throughout my life up to seventh grade and then it was just an hour after school I would be in clubs and she would be home so I never felt her. Uh, as a little girl you, you, you kind of want your parent to be there you know and so I was lucky in that respect you know because I always had her with me. Yeah, was, was, your, fa was your father in your memory was it a nine to five job or were there night shifts do you remember? Um, he, he was uh, nine to five and um, he would get uh, two weeks vacation. I remember that, the end of July. One of the weeks we would walk down to Lonzi's Blue Mountain Reservation at picnics and the other week he would work at Wilkins Fruit Farm picking peaches so he could buy shoes for us, for school. Yeah, so it was, it, it was we never felt like we were deprived of things, and, and we lived from week to week, but it was a happy, happy time. Thank you so much for your time. This is very enlightening, and I really appreciate you speaking with me today. Thank you. Really love it. Hi, my name is Norman E. Haight. I uh, am a longtime resident of Peekskill. I was born here. Um, I'm the fifth Norman in my family. Um, we go back generationally. Um, many, many generations even beyond uh, in Peekskill and Phillipstown and um, Montrose, Buchanan, Verplank, Croton, you name it. Um, my, I'm here to talk about Fleischmann's because I had this wonderful experience here today to um, have a retrospective about um, the Fleischmann plant, um, which is in everyone's heart here, um, which is the mainstay in Peekskill um, a time ago. And I'm here to talk in memory of my aunt, my dear aunt Dorothy Welsh, um, who worked uh, bottling whiskey and gin at the, uh, the plant here in Peekskill, also known as Standard Brands, for 33 years. Uh, she started working there when she was age 16. I believe that was like 1941. And uh, as I grew up, um, she was a person that helped to nurture me uh, along with my mom and my grandmother, who are hardworking women. Um, and that's what this, um, the thing that I remember about Peekskill is all the hardworking men and women um, who made our community uh, what it is today, even still. Um, unfortunately, manufacturing is gone, but the memory lingers, especially for me. And I, I just am excited to have this opportunity to speak about um, my experience as a young man, a young boy, really, um, and uh, viewing my aunt walking across the Louisa Street Bridge. Um, there was no highway into the plant on the north end, and everybody walked in en masse uh, at the beginning of their shift. Um, and it was quite a sight to see. And more excitingly, um, when she came home and when she was going to join with us and we'd all pile in the car and go into downtown Peekskill and my my aunt and my grandmother and my dad that everybody would cash their checks and uh, go shopping in a very bustling community at the time so um, I remember my aunt being she never married um, and she was a uh, second mother to me and my sister and uh, care t was a caretaker for our family. And she worked long and hard all those years, but she was a very proud worker, um, gave her a lot of dignity. Um, and she uh, was a, a shop steward uh, at one time and very involved in the Yeast Makers Union. Um, and I, I have fond memories of her marching in the I Am an American Day Parade in Peekskill. Uh, I believe it was in the late 60s, uh, carrying, helped carrying the banner for the union. And uh, it was, it was uh, she was my heart and soul. And, um, and I had a lot of other aunts, if you will, with all the, the ladies who bottled whiskey and gin. It was the, the women that I remember mostly, although there was a lot of uh, great men who uh, did a lot of the heavy lifting, but um, 
they were a unique bunch of, of women who were bringing home a paycheck uh, to help you know everybody live um, and they were they were very proud about that and as a result I got to know some of these ladies very well and I she had a dear friend uh, I called her Aunt Jane um, and I have a friend that I went to high school with and when we were little um, they always provided for us in ways that maybe our parents could and were always dressing us up dressing us up as cute as buttons and getting on the train and going into the city the Radio City Music Hall and going to Schraff's and having experiences that I wouldn't have otherwise and because of her hard work she she gave everything to us I wouldn't have known music if it wasn't for her she paid for my accordion lessons for seven years um, she was cheering me on and my younger sister in every way that you can imagine um, but sadly, after a long career, Fleischmann's had to close, Standard Brands. And it closed down um, in a way that a lot of industrial towns in the Hudson Valley were experiencing. And um, with the birth of technology and economic uh, decisions were made. And when the plant closed, it was very difficult. Um, and it, it, she never really was the same. but. Um, she was very proud until the end. And um, so I have a, when I heard about this event, I just grabbed what I had in the family album and I ran down here. I, I literally live three blocks up here on uh, Union Avenue from the Peekskill Museum. So um, I, I heard a fascinating presentation and I've already been talking with some people who are still here that have uh, memories like I do. Um, and I'm very excited to be able to do that and to be here um, and, and have this experience and be able to honor her because um, she's someone that really lives with me every day. Um, and, uh, and I just appreciate the opportunity to even be sitting here and doing this. This is quite unexpected.